from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2020, virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and ecosystem partners. Welcome back, I'm Stu Miniman and this is theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon, CloudNativeCon Europe 2020, the virtual edition. Of course, it, this ecosystem has been bustling a lot of activity uh, in the five years that we've been covering it with theCUBE. We've watched very much the maturation of what's going on. Uh, remember in the early days, it was open source projects, uh, companies pulling all of the pieces together. Uh, now, there's a lot more things to choose from, lots of projects, not just Kubernetes, but all, all the other pieces. Um, and still lots of new innovations and new startups coming into the space. So happy to welcome to the program. I have two first time guests from Spectro Cloud. First of all, we have the co-founder and CEO, Tenry Fu, and also uh, Tina Nolte, who's the Vice President of Product. Tina and Tenry, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Bye, focus. All right, so, so Tenry, as one of the co-founders, I, I want to understand you know, why Spectro Cloud, why now? Uh, you know, many outsiders would say, have said for a while, you know, Kubernetes, it's just getting baked into all of the environments. I looked at all the platforms, whether you're talking, you know, Google and AWS or VMware, uh, they all have their platforms, they all have their managed services offering. So help us understand what your team does and, and how you differentiate from what's already existing. Absolutely, yeah. So I actually used to work at VMware, right? And that, uh, uh, I saw cloud taking off, right? And then I left VMware, start my first startup called Liquid Technologies, which focused on multi-cloud management. But at that time, really, multi-cloud management through single pane of glass is the only thing you can do, right? And then Clicker later got acquired by Cisco. Uh, so at Cisco, I kind of witnessed uh, the container and the Kubernetes taking off, right? And it makes a lot of sense, right? For the first time, both of application workload and the uh, infrastructure become truly portable across multiple environments. But also very interestingly, at Cisco, I observed there are many developer team, right? That they adopting Kubernetes and everyone is doing a little bit different things. But that because different teams, they have a different stack construct requirement, right? Some for AI ML, some they need a different base OS, some they just want to have a different version, right? And a lot of existing solutions doesn't really provide this kind of a flexibility to satisfy all the different needs, right? One size fit all, typically is one size fit for nothing. Uh, so we ask ourselves, why can't we try to create a platform that will give people the flexibility, but not turn it into a DIY project, right? Still have a full manageability so that user don't need to worry about the upgrade, day to operations, governance, so on and so forth. Yes. Yeah, T Tina, I, I, I know when I, I've looked at your product, uh, it's, it's discussed as layers, uh, which <laughs> my background's in networking, so I love seeing things visually and understanding the pieces uh, as they lay out the stack. So maybe help us understand a little bit as to uh, you, you know, that flexibility that you give um, and how it's not just the paradox of choice, just too many <laughs> options out there and uh, you know, developers left to create their own mess that they can't then support. <laughs> yeah, so you know, as Tenry mentioned, uh, offering folks flexibility without turning into a do-it-yourself, you know, hot mess is is what we're what we're helping people um, do at, at Spectral Cloud. Uh, the core of our solution, uh, the core of the differentiation within our solution is around this concept of a cluster profile. And as you mentioned, the cluster profile uh, basically allows people to define um, in a layered fashion what's part of their Kubernetes infrastructure stack. So at the bottom, you're talking, what's the base operating system? What's the version of Kubernetes that, that's going to be part of clusters that uses profile? Uh, what's your networking and storage interface look like? And then on top of that, you have a number of optional layers. So again, you know, back to flexibility and manageability, we give people options around what those other layers look like on top. They include everything from security, logging, monitoring, et cetera. Just anything that you want to go ahead and kind of bake into a definition, a profile of what a cluster should look like in one of your deployed environments. 
All right, well, I want to make sure I understand when you talk about Kubernetes in there, can it be, you know, say VMware with vSphere 7 uh, now, now has Kubernetes support. Red Hat OpenShift uh, is an option. All of the cloud players have their, you know, AKS, EKS, uh, and, and the like. Can I bake that Kubernetes in, or uh, are, are, are you taking a, a different approach? We're going with upstream vanilla Kubernetes today. Uh, that allows us to go ahead and provide what's you know, newest within the ecosystem um, and let people go ahead and, and have a really open, um, really open solution that, that, that they're playing. Okay, um, so when I talk to, when you look out there, a lot of companies are saying, how can I manage uh, multiple clusters? So if, if you look at what Google, uh, Microsoft, and VMware, they're talking about we can manage our clusters and we can also help you with those other clusters. How, how does that impact, Tenry, your solution? Do, does it need to be, it, it's just the upstream solution that I, that I put into that cluster profile or can I connect to, uh, say, a managed uh, cloud solution? Yeah, so I think in terms of multi-cluster management, right, the consistency is really the key. Right? So through this uh, class profile concept, uh, not only it can be used as an initial template to deploy cluster, but it can also use uh, as a single source for truth uh, to drive the, the cluster lifecycle management in terms of the upgrade. Uh, so right now, uh, as Tina mentioned, we primarily focus on upstream because we want to provide the maximum flexibility in terms of entire end-to-end -end Kubernetes stack. Uh, but we do also have a plan that down the road that we're going to import brownfield existing clusters. So that enterprise uh, existing investment to their Kubernetes infrastructure can be uh, under managed by us as well. Well, there always reaches a time when the brand new technology gets called brownfield. I think that's the first time I've heard something like you know EKS uh, or, or, or the like uh, you know referred to as brownfield. Uh, Tina, I, I, you know I, when I think back to my history with with integrated solutions. Uh, obviously, if, if I have the various pieces, it should be easier for me to stay on the latest, make upgrades, roll things forward or roll things back. But you know, what, what, give us, if you could, some of the, the, the key values of uh, you know, building these cluster profiles, what that enables uh, for your customers. Yeah, so the key around cluster profiles, we offer this policy-based management. So you describe as an administrator, um, what it is that those clusters need to look like, right? And we've got, we adopt a declarative desired state, you know, management approach, a la what Kubernetes does itself. Um, and so what you're able to get through adopting and utilizing cluster profiles is this guarantee that from deployment and then into day two as well, what you've described in this profile uh, winds up maintaining itself, it remains true um, of the clusters that have been deployed. So what it is that you require as far as the operating system, what it is you require as far as some configuration options, et cetera. So the profile itself winds up being ground source of truth around what it is that, that you've got running in all these various locations um, across clouds, across different clusters, et cetera. All right, uh, Tenry, you, you mentioned that uh, having things more standardized uh, is, is going to help customers. Absolutely, we saw that in data centers uh, for, for a long time and standardized. How do you help customers make sure that the configurations that they build are, are going to work, are going to be stable, if they make changes that they're not going to get things uh, out, of, out of sync? Is there you know, an interoperability matrix or, or some other ways that uh, we're, we're trying to make sure that customers you know, stay on the rails, if you will? Absolutely, right? so through our system, right, all the integration points, we carry the additional metadata right, to, uh, to basically give the, the uh, hint uh, about the uh, uh, compatibility, uh, resource constraints, right? and also the uh, upgradability right, in terms of uh, uh, moving from one version to another. Uh, so this way we can kind of give users some guidance uh, when they initially construct the class profile, on what will work together nicely and what will not, right? And then on top of that, uh, when upgrading from one existing cluster to a new version of a cluster profile definition, then we can look at the environment, right, to understand, right, if there's something that potentially incompatible will popping up, right? So we call that a pre-pilot configuration check, right? 
And uh, also post deployment, uh, we also allow user to run additional conformant tests so that make sure the cluster, everything is actually still acting uh, as, as it's supposed to be. Another way to explain that is that, yeah. You know, the cluster profile concept has a lot of flexibility attached with, to it, right? That's a lot of power. It can get you into trouble if you don't have the right safety nets and safety harnesses underneath you. So we have a multi-layered approach to, to helping make sure that people are getting uh, benefit out of that flexibility. W wonderful, and I'm, I'm wondering, did, did when you've had more customers using this, is there shared information? Are there community guidelines that, that help? Uh, you know, understand when it's going to be okay. Hey, 1.19's out. We're looking at 1.20. Um, you, you might want to do this, or hey, if you're using uh, you're using uh, this piece of networking, you might want to wait a little bit before you go to the next version. That's definitely the idea over time. Uh, folks that are engaging with us are very interested in the fact that because of the fact that we're a SaaS management platform, a SaaS-based management platform, at least today, um, that it offers them the opportunity to learn from their peers, if you will, right? And their peers' experiences. Uh, on top of that, we also have the ability to watch just what's been going on in other deployments in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And we can make sure that all that's available, as Tenry mentioned, you know, in the form of the metadata that's, that's um, on top of those packs. All right, how about, how do you price this solution? When I look out there, I talked about Kubernetes baked into all the platforms. Oftentimes it can be baked into an ELA. It's, it's part of you know, my, my just general cloud spend from that platform. So how do you do the pricing and you know, are you plugged into any of the cloud marketplaces yet? Yeah, so flexibility is really part of our DNA, right? So, so even for pricing, we want to provide the maximum flexibility to our customers. Right, so unlike some traditional solution, typically is priced based on number of cores, right, uh, per year, uh, or, or even number of nodes, right? So we actually price based on number of uh, CPU cores uh, uh, of a worker node, right, under management by hour. So what we call those are core hour under management, right? And then every thousand core hours as one unit, uh, we call kilo core hours. So kind of uh, similar to how electricity is consumed, right? So this way, based on these core hour consumption, we allow user to either pay as you go as a monthly on-demand plan, or you can do an annual commitment plan if you want. And we are in process on the marketplaces. Yeah. All right, how about, uh, uh, we, we talked about Kubernetes, I think service mesh are part of it. What, what in this, Cube, KubeCon Cloud Native Con ecosystem, which, which projects are the most tied into what you're doing? Anything that uh, Spectre Cloud is uh, particularly contributing to that you can share? Yeah, so uh, our system uh, is uh, built on top of uh, Kubernetes uh, Class API project. Uh, so we are one of the contributor to uh, Class API. Uh, we are actively adding additional functionality to enhance class API, especially right, in some of the VMware environment for some customer use case, uh, such as uh, static IP or some special placement uh, behaviors. Uh, and also adding additional contribute uh, on different cloud support. Yeah, and as far as things that we're watching, I mean, clearly we're, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of people on our customer front that are interested in actual deployment of Service Mesh now. Um, so that's something that you know we're, we're going to be more engaged in over time. Um, and another one that uh, we're, we're hoping to see uh, check out more talks around at KubeCon is AIML, right? A lot of interest on the part of customers around AIML use cases. Yeah, absolutely. Edge and AI and ML, uh, definitely very hot topics of conversation uh, this, this year at the, at the Herb Show. I expect that to continue. Uh, Tina, I'm wondering, do you have any customer examples, maybe even anonymized, uh, that could kind of just explain uh, the, the, the key values that your customers are seeing using your solution? Yeah, sure. So we've got uh, one of our earliest customers is a Canadian financial um, who, came to us because they were looking to figure out how to manage consistently at scale. Um, and they had the problem that Tenery described earlier, 
uh, around, I've got different development teams, they have different needs, and you know, how do you satisfy all those guys without, um, without going crazy, <laughs> right? So uh, they've got an AI ML use case, that's a special snowflake. They've got two separate teams in different groups that would like to be under an IT management umbrella. That's, that's a convergence use case that they're looking at. So kind of a typical example of somebody that, that we think of as um, you know, a really good set of people for us to be having conversations with. Um, we've also been working with a telecom provider that, that kind of fits in a similar, similar vein, actually. There's an AI ML group, there are multiple teams of different infrastructure and they want to be able to consistently manage. It's a story that we're, we're seeing over and over again, thankfully. <laughs> Yeah, we also see right from I think at the individual group or team level, right? Because there are a lot of uh, uh, kind of a product owner or data scientist, right? They really want to have a kind of an easy button to quickly be able to provision a Kubernetes cluster that suit for their need, right? And a lot of these uh, groups, their primary focus is really their application, right? Uh, it's not their interest to spend a lot of time and resource on Kubernetes management in terms of deploying, update, right, secure, and operation. Uh, so through us, uh, they can very easily spin up a Kubernetes cluster, whether it's for AIML or for developing experiment, right? they can very quickly do that, but with the flexibility, right? because a lot of existing solution, they may limit them, the version of a Kubernetes cluster, they may limit the, what kind of integration that they can do. Yeah, uh, Tenry, you, you, we, we talked a little bit earlier about you know, potential integration down the road. I'm, I'm curious, just there's so many companies creating innovations out there. You know, say for example, one, one that I hear a lot of feedback on is AWS now has Fargate support uh, for their EKS offering. Um, is that something down the line you should look at or do, do you have some guidance as to how customers should be thinking about that and if they want that kind of functionality, how they would get that with a solution like yours? Yeah, actually, we really share the same vision as AWS, right? So uh, we believe ultimately the infrastructure really should be transparent uh, to application developers, right? And it should be boundaryless. So our goal is not only manage Kubernetes across multiple environments, uh, but eventually we'll be able to link all these clusters together to make them acting as a single infrastructure so developers, they can still use their familiar Kubernetes interface to deploy and manage their application, but without worry about how infrastructure underneath uh, is operated or managed, right? So this, in a way, will eventually become kind of a Fargate model, but across multiple cluster and multiple, uh, multiple clouds. All right, uh, Tina, if, maybe if you could give us the final takeaway. Uh, people attending KubeCon, CloudNativeCon, What's the one thing that if you know, they have a problem, they should be coming to Spectral Cloud to hear more about? Yeah, sure. So what Spectral Cloud aims to do is help enterprises uh, not have to trade off between flexibility and control of their infrastructure and manageability and ease of use. That's, that's, the, that's the, main, the main thing that, that we would like people to, to remember. All right, well, Tenry and Tina, thank you so much for sharing uh, with our community a little bit about Spectral Cloud. Great talking to you and look forward to hearing more in the future. Thanks Thank so much. Yeah. All right, and stay tuned, more coverage from KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 2020. I'm Stu Miniman and thank you for watching theCUBE.